Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the fifth session of the Bahamas Natural Resources Foundation Emerging Leaders Development Program. I am excited that you're here. This week, we have an exciting session. You know, if you remember, we first started out with talking about strategies and business acumen. We went on to looking at emotional quotient, or your, in, your emotional quotient versus your intellectual um, assessment and understanding the challenges around that. Then we had last week our Maslow hierarchy and self-actualization with Dr. Hicks, which was a very good experience. And I know that I've, I sent some emails out in a WhatsApp group and I've asked you guys to really look at these competencies and skills. One moment. Competencies and skill sets in order for you guys to really incorporate it into your projects. So what I'm going to do now is just gonna give a Trey, how are you today? Let's do some little welcoming. How are you, how are you doing today, Trey? Good afternoon, um, I'm doing well. Uh, can't complain in the, best, uh, in the best country in the world. I'm doing great. And you, Mr. Thunanam? I am doing well, thank you. I've, you know, it's like a, a boulder, in a, in, see a boulder in the road, right? And you can say, okay, that boulder is gonna stop my journey. But you have to imagine that you're water. So you're gonna go over it, under it, around it, but you have to keep on moving. So when you see obstacles in your life, it's not a, it's not a set moment to stop, it's how do we get around it, get over it. So Mr. Darville, Jared, how are you today, sir? I'm good, I'm good, Mr. Cunningham, how are you doing? I'm doing well, I'm doing well. How is your week going, your week is doing well? Yeah, yeah, my week is doing good, man, right on par. Wonderful. Oh, but happy belated birthday. It was your birthday. Oh, thank you. Yourself. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. That's wonderful. How's everything going with you? Oh, I'm, I'm right here. Sometimes I feel like I'm between Toby and the dog. <laughs> oh, man. that's I, I see you have a lot on your plate with the uh, technical oh. difficulties would be hard. So. Yes, but we just move forward. How about you, Miss yes. Gibson? How are you today? You doing well? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. Did your mom tell you about her, her, her new act, acting role with the foundation? She didn't tell you what happened? She is, she's our acting treasurer. Yeah, she did. She did oh, tell me. Yes, yes. She's our the artist. interim, right? Yes. Yes, yes. She told me. She told me. <laughs> wonderful. So she have, made me aware. Oh, excellent. Jabez, how are you, sir? Jabez, can uh, you I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. Just trying to make sure. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay. Yes, wonderful. Yes, I'm doing pretty good. Just trying to get um, settled after my technical difficulties. Yes, that's one of the things we find with this Zoom, Zoom arena. And Kaylin and O'Neill, how are you, sir? How is our law students doing today? Oh, Kaylin, you're doing a bait and Oh, you're doing a switcheroo. Oh, there you are. Oh, how are you, sir, Mr. Meadows? I'm good, I'm good. Just getting in, you know, trying to get comfortable for the meeting tonight. Oh, excellent. Yes, wonderful smile. How about you, Mr. McCartney, Kaylin? How are you tonight? Um, Sam, Sam, I'm doing good also, you know. Just getting on a moment ago. Okay, wonderful. So I'm going to go now. We're go ahead and start our Facebook Live. And once I start that live, I'll go ahead and introduce our guest speaker and we will move forward from there. Here we go. Good evening, Facebook and, and the Bahamas community. I welcome you to the fifth session of the Bahamas Natural Resources Foundation Emerging Leaders Development Program. This evening, we have a guest speaker who will present to us on the topic of identifying and optimizing leadership styles. So the person I'd like to have you we'll bring to, I would like to bring to the table and introduce to you is Miss Camilla Elliott. Camilla is, just to let you know, she's a personal friend of mine. So don't even ask because she will not say anything to you about me. We'll keep that secret. But Camilla is the president of Grid 202 Partners. It's a financial planning firm, which is located in Washington, DC, and is dedicated to financial planning, 
and investment experience, but also let me, not just Washington DC, also in Georgia and North Carolina in the United States. She, she works with, with assisting high net worth individuals, endowments and foundations, and, and business owners with comprehensive wealth solutions and holistic planning. Who knows, maybe one day we'll be her client. Um, so Cam Camilla has spent, Kamala has- Camilla. Camilla has- spent Whenever Kamala became vice president in the US, everyone was like, people are gonna call you Kamala, you know, like you're done. And so it's funny, everyone calls me Kamala now. I mean, I don't mind people calling me Kamala, I like her, but yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you, Camila. Um, she, well, she spent most of her professional career at Vanguard, working with ultra high net worth individuals and endowments, and inclusive of that was major universities, hospital and charitable organizations. Her clients were, were in the range of 20 million to $450 million and represented $3 billion in total assets. That's what she managed um, prior to her leaving that role. She's now the, the, on the board of directors of the CFP CFP board. Now the CFP board of directors is the policy making and oversight body of certified financial planner, planner board of standards incorporated, which represents over 88,000 financial professionals in the United States. She will be the chair of the CFP board in 2022. And that's an honorable mention because she will be the first African-American woman and the youngest ever, the youngest human being ever to serve in that role. She serves on the Investment Committee for Women Against Abuse, located in Philadelphia. She also is an active volunteer with the IRS Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. She holds a BA and an MBA from the Pennsylvania State University, or Penn State as some may know it as. She's a certified financial planner and holds a, li holds a license of life, health, and long-term insurance. So Kamala, Camila, welcome to our program. If you wish to um, present your program, I can, you can share the screen, which has been enabled. Okay, let me go ahead and get started. All right, are we good? Yes. Okay, thank you Aj for that warm welcome and introduction and good evening to all of you. Uh, so today I'll be discussing identifying and optimizing leadership styles. Um, so before I begin, I'm going to share with you that leadership styles are not born, they're developed and grown. Um, so I'll just point, you know, I spent a lot of time at Vanguard, most of my professional career. And within that, my roles at Vanguard, I would say half of my roles were in leadership. Um, I managed teams ranging from 10. My largest group was over 40 individuals. Um, and I had the pleasure of leading sales teams, which is even more interesting and more, more nuanced. Um, and you're leading groups that are charged with bringing in revenue to an organization. So a lot of things I want to talk about today are not because I'm special, I have a magic gift. No, a lot of it is being trained, being supported, and being developed, having really great mentors. And I'll say this one thing, some of the best things about developing your leadership style is just observing. You know, you've all been exposed to leaders, like teachers are leaders, right? Teachers are leading a classroom. And what you learn is you learn from great leaders, but you also learn from bad leaders, right? You learn how you like to be lead and developed, and you also learn how you do not want to be led and developed. So today I'm going to talk about creating your leadership style. We're going to go over the different leadership styles and how they work and how you can flex. And then we'll spend some time for Q&A. Um, and I'm also going to share some resources for all of you to continue learning about how developing your own leadership style. So we already did that part already. So these are tips from Harvard Business Review, right? So when you think about developing your leadership style, there are a few things that you should do um, or not do. And one is imitation is the enemy. One of the things that you don't want to do is find a leadership style of someone that you, let's say, like and just try to imitate it. So imitation is the enemy. And why do I say that? 
you are who you are and you have to know yourself. You, ha you have to know how you um, communicate. Are you an empathetic person? Are you more of a straightforward person? Um, are you someone that gets in the details or are you high level and visionary? You have to know yourself to develop your own leadership style. And what people tend to do is say, I write a book and I'm gonna follow this person's style and I'm gonna emulate it and you will fail miserably because you are who you are and you cannot be anyone else um, when you develop your style. The second thing is knowing your strengths and weaknesses. Um, one of the books, I probably should have mentioned this, Aj, but one of my favorite books that I think every new leader should do is an exercise is now discover your strengths. Do, are you guys familiar with, with that book? No, I'm not. Okay, so now discover your strengths. It, it's, it's a really, you don't, we don't read a lot of the book, but you take an online assessment. It can be, it's pretty lengthy, I'll admit. But what they do is they discover your top five strengths. What are you best at? And then they tell you the pros and cons of those strengths. So for me, um, and Aj probably knows this, but one of my top strengths is I'm a relator, right? I'm someone that if you meet with me, I'm gonna find something we have in common. Within the first five minutes, I'll find a, a city, a food, a drink, travel, someone we have in common. That's what I do. That's how I'm a very relational in nature. The second um, strength I have is I'm an achiever. And by an achiever means type A personality. Having a type A personality is good and people like, they think it's a fantastic thing, but a downside of a type A personality is you don't know when to stop. We just keep going and working and working and we kind of drive really hard and we don't pause and stop and think and be visionary, right? We're, we're very, we, we push forward, right? So now discover your strengths is a great tool because it tells you this is what makes you great as a leader or as a professional but on the other side, these are some cons to your, to your um, professional presence and leadership style that you should work on. And the benefit of knowing that is you'll know what leadership style you're best aligned to. And secondly, as you become a leader, you know how to build a team. You know how to build a team that complements your style. So for example, I'm a relator. I don't need a relator on my direct team. I can do that, right? I, I can go in and I can sell and I can woo. What I need, because what relators we don't do is, we don't like the details, right? We don't like the administrative work behind it. So I'll share with you, I have an associate planner I actually brought on um, about over a year ago. She's a former police officer, extremely process oriented and detailed. And I specifically sought her out because I needed someone that complemented my leadership style. So it's good for you to know, you know, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, but you also know, need to know um, how to build a team. So it's kind of like basketball, right? Um, you know, I was watching this thing. So just so you guys, are you guys basketball fans before I use this analogy? Do you guys watch US basketball? 100%. Uh, okay. We do. All right. Yes. I'm from Philly. Don't talk about Ben Simmons, please. We're going to pass by that whole, whole fourth quarter. <laughs> um, but when you build a team, you need to build a team of complementary players, right? So think about it. If you, if you could build your perfect team, someone that can always shoot the threes, right? Someone that can go on the paint, someone who's defensive and can rebound. You don't pick a team of five three-pointers, right? You don't need that. So the same thing when you think about developing a team around your leadership style, you have to find a team of individuals that complement each other. So no matter what position you are, where you are on the, um, on the court, you can still succeed and, and win the game. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, yeah, it does. So. Okay. Um, understand the influence of bias. And what do I mean about that? We all have biases and preferences of what we like in leaders. You may like, what you may like about someone, someone will not like. And one thing about a leader is you have to be confident 
that the style is best for you and know that everyone won't like you, <laughs> right? Um, everyone does not like every leader. So like one of the leader that I like, but everyone doesn't like is Jack Welch. You guys know him. He was the CEO of GE, huge company. He was immensely successful in driving results. He was really tough. He was not empathetic, but he got things done. So some employees really liked him and some employees hated him, right? <laughs> and so you have to realize any successful leader, you're not gonna please everyone. They're gonna have biases of what they envision your leadership style should be, and you have to be okay with that. And the last and most important, and particularly for women, right? Because this is where we tend to lack. And I'll admit, even me is in my leadership journey, this is what I had to continuously develop. I had to be brave, right? I had to be courageous. I had to sometimes just pull the trigger and make a decision and be okay with it. Leaders who do well, leaders that you all remember, these are not leaders that played it safe. These are not leaders that stayed in the guardrails. Every leader that you think of was brave. So I'm gonna ask you guys, what, what leader do you think of? Like when you think of a good leader, who, who, who comes to your mind at first? Um, for me personally, it would be Nelson Mandela and uh, his courageous sitting inside himself. I think it was 20 years refusing. Um, if his people were not going to be free, then he wasn't going to be free as well. So I mainly think of Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. But you think about Nelson's leadership styles, even before he was imprisoned, right? He was very, um, he was a consensus builder. He didn't encourage violence, right? So there are a lot of individuals in South Africa. So I, w I went to South Africa a few years ago um, and, 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 you know, and, and went to the apartheid museum and, and saw the journey. There were people that wanted him to be like Malcolm X, right, Trey? They wanted people to say like, all right. right. Yeah, so there are, you, you are, you, you know, in South Africa, right? Africans are, I mean, Afri you know, Blacks are the majority. Why is this white majority ruling this, this country? If you, if we all, I'm saying we just uprised, we could take them over, right? <laughs> really, really quickly. I mean, they have money and, and weapons, but in numbers. So you think about someone you have, you think about has a good legacy. Even at that time, Trey, individuals did not like Nelson Mandela because they thought he was too conciliatory to white Africans or to the white, white South Africans. So no matter who you are, you are always going to have detractors. Even coming out, he was a key um, participant in, um, sorry, it's 7.30 here. What's, what is the Aj? Um, it was the plan they did with, um, it was the, what is it? The, um, where they all made amends from what happened with the party. Oh, the reconciliation. Reconciliation, thank you, right? So there's a lot of detractors that when he did leave prison and the, he made reconciliation, it, like, let's move past it. A lot of individuals didn't want to move past it, <laughs> right? They were like, look, it was so many years we were held back. And even in the townships, it's still not adequate conditions. Like I've never seen anything like that in my entire life as what I saw in the townships, right? Um, so think about leaders that even though you can be a great leader, you can be an historical leader, being brave, there will still be people who will not like you who will not support you, but you can't listen to them. You have to listen to what's in most important to you, what's in your heart and what you think will drive the best results, knowing your own leadership style. Any questions about that? Nope, okay. Yeah, I have a question. Just, just in terms of like, how do you cope or deal with uh, um, people not liking you? For the most part, I guess, for, pe for people like us who are emerging leaders who may have not been in any leadership position, we aren't, I guess, may not be used to hearing or knowing the thoughts of other people. But it seems as when you are in those positions, people are more vocal about how they feel about you or um, they are vocal about pointing out some of, some of the things that you may have done that they don't like or your way of doing things. So how do you cope or deal with that. So I always say in my mind, um, your name is Jafar. I can't say. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Aj, Aj knows. I, I, 
I am the queen of code switching. You guys know what code switching is, right? You guys know what code switching is? You may have to explain it. Okay. Because someone told me I'm a good code switcher. So you guys probably have already imagined I spent my entire career in financial services where I am the only woman at times, the only African-American, and I speak differently in those settings, right? So code switching means when you're with, when you're with the majority and you need to act in a really professional way, you can do that. But when time to you relax, you're with people who are like you, you feel comfortable with, you trust, you're more casual in your language and the real you starts to come out, right? So Jafar, I'm gonna say this as a response because I think this is important. What always run in my mind is haters are going to hate, right? People will always find something to not like about you. Um, you could be the perfect person and they will have a problem with your perfection. And as I've gotten older, I just had to realize that. And what I think comfort and solace with at night is that when you do good things with good intentions, good things happen and you have to ignore everything else. So always ask myself, am I doing something with good intention? Am I doing something with a good outcome? If I can say that in the affirmative, I'm fine. I think what, what happens to people and what leads to their downfall and leads to stress is when you do things with bad intention, when you do things to get around something or you do things solely in your self-interest, that's when the walls come crumbling down. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I so I have a question. When it comes to leadership, is it, is, it, is it more about the results or how we get the results done? For example, we mentioned, we mentioned Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a person who would be the vast opposite to him would probably be Oded Nobunaga. For those of you who don't know the ASU, he was the first unifier of Japan. And one of his strategies was to be as ruthless as possible. He got, it, he got it done, but not as ethically as we probably would have liked. So is it more about the results? as a leader or how you get those results done? I think it's both. And I think it's, I think it's even. Um, and, but sometimes, I'm gonna be honest, Trey, sometimes in life, the result supersedes the how. But in most times I focus is it, like, I, I would say, um, what, what is the word? Um, you have to assess collateral damage. You guys know what collateral damage is? Right. Okay. Sometimes yes. you have less collateral damage, right? So you, you may want this event to occur, this outcome to happen, but people are going to make it hurt along the way. And when you make a decision, that's one thing you have to assess is what's the collateral damage, right? I think that's why you're asking the how, right? Like the how, like, you know, people say, you know, all those, like, are you a narcissist quote, you know, kind of quizzes, like, would you kill five people to save a thousand, right? Like th those kind of scenarios, right? And it's hard because sometimes you do have to assess, like, what's the collateral damage? People will be hurt, thing, you know, people won't be happy with you, but if you're saving a thousand lives, at the end, that's the right thing to do, right? Um, but usually, you know, in corporate America, in regular leadership, the how is just as important as the why or what you're trying to accomplish or the what I should say, how and the what. Um, but in really dire circumstances, there will be collateral damage and that's just how life is. Not a great answer, I know, but sometimes it is happening. true, thanks. <laughs> it's just true, right? You know, it, you know, it's just how life is, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Any other questions before we hop into the leadership styles? And then when I'm reading these leadership styles to you, I want you to think of someone you know. It could be a coworker, a leader, a teacher, a mentor, a parent, right? Because parents are leaders. Think about anyone that could fit into this leadership style. And I'm gonna pause after each one to kind of to have a discussion about it, okay? Please leave me out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, come on. All right. I do have. <laughs> I do have uh, one question. Uh -huh. um, what do you, what would you say is the most important uh, quality of a leader? I mean, granted that everybody isn't going to like you. What's, what's the thing that everybody must do? Cause I mean, I'm thinking it should be respect. Like nobody, everybody isn't going to like you, of course, but 
other than respect, or uh, well, would you say the most important thing that people do um, do would be respect? Or I would say be authentic, um, because people can sense fakeness people a mile away, right? And I think if you lead with authenticity, everything else will follow, right? People will trust you. Okay. People follow you, people will be loyal to you, people will value your thoughts and your experience. But you could be a really smart person, you could get a lot of initially results done. But if you're not authentic, um, it will be short lived. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's talk through the first one. So um, the first one is autocratic. Um, one person controls all the decisions and takes very little inputs from other group members. They make um, decisions or choices based on their beliefs and do not involve others for their suggestions or advice. And autocracy is what they call it sometimes. So pros, right? If you have one person making all the decisions, you can make a decision really quickly because you're just talking to yourself, right? Um, you can take better control of processes or money. You know how sometimes if I want to do it right, I'll do it myself. That's what how autocrats think. I'm going to do it myself because I know it'll be right, right? Um, and it's helpful in times of crisis when you need to make a really quick decision and things are going wrong. If it's just you making a decision, you can effectively lead. Now, as you would imagine, this can resemble a dictatorship by looking at the visual. So I kind of picked these bubbles of like what, what demonstrates and they'll be pretty consistent, but it's really a dictatorship. Um, it can lead to low employee morale for obvious reasons. Um, someone's making all the decisions without, make, without taking consideration any of your input whatsoever. And there's no diversity of perspective, right? No one's saying maybe you shouldn't do this, right? So you guys would appreciate this, right? Like, I, did you guys hear about Michael B. Jordan and the rum he was starting and he got himself in trouble? Because obviously he didn't know any trainees because any trainee would have told him, do not name this rum juve. But he was running an autocratic <laughs> decision-making process where he wasn't getting input of others because if he did and he had any trainee friends, he wouldn't have done that, right? So that's, that's an example of you do things with no diversity perspective, you're making your own decisions and not involving others and what can happen. So does anyone know any autocratics? No one's gonna say their mom, I'm just joking. Like, <laughs> too much of them, I know too many. Yeah, we can start with our prime minister. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> I was waiting. I was waiting on someone to say that, you know. <laughs> oh gosh, I, is this is this recorded? Or don't make sure you put this on your laptop and not on the cloud, okay? <laughs> it's it's too late. We're, we're we're streaming live on Facebook. Okay, um, but any other autocratics <laughs> that you guys can think of? No. I don't you want you want a historical Sorry. example or current example? Yeah, it can be either. Well, the North Korean powers are very autocratic based on how they run. The person I mentioned before, Odin Nobunaga, he was very autocratic. And I had a few managers that were very autocratic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have, was, oh, oh sorry. Oh, go ahead. There are some spouses who are autocratic, by the way. That's correct. There's some spouses. <laughs> Autocratic. But I'm gonna I'm gonna play on um, Trace Kim Jong Un, right? He's an he's he's an autocrat, right? And what happens to his country, right? Um, yes, they're functioning. Yes, they make quick decisions. Um, but are the people there happy? No, they're always trying to like they they guard the border <laughs> with their dear life and they shoot you if you try to leave, right? So like obviously people aren't happy there, right? Um, and they're basically cut off from world trade in, in significant ways versus South Korea, right? Um, that's moved to being a developed country. So you guys can see there's benefits in that they're functioning, but they're not functioning well, right? Okay. All right, the next one is similar, but this one's called authoritative. So again, the leaders is in complete control they set goals, determine processes, oversees all the steps it takes to reach the goals with little or no input from others. 
But the difference here between authoritative and autocratic is that autocratic will do it all and authoritative will show you how to create the task. And once they show you how to do it, they let you take it from there, okay? So the pros again, quick decision-making. The people are very productive. It's because there's little room for mistakes because you tell them what to do it and they're like widgets and they just, you know, like little robots and they just do what you tell them to do in the same form or fashion. Um, helpful in times of crisis, again, when, you, when things are happening, um, you know, out, out of your control or you have an issue, authoritative limits any um, issues or delays. But the con is that you're just telling me what to do. Like, I have no mind or thoughts. And I'm supposed to just kind of just do what you say. So employees feel undervalued. Um, it does not foster new innovation because they're saying, do what I tell you to do. And then no diversity of perspective. Again, there's no process improvement. So it's like, I'm gonna tell you how to do it. You just do it from there. Any, anyone know any author, authoritatives? like that's just anyone's boss <laughs> not all bosses are this way um i'm trying to think of someone who would be good authoritative um actually jack welch i mentioned the ceo he's it's a good book if you guys want to yeah i forget the name of his book but you can just check jack welch um he was more of authoritative leadership figure he he had a vision of what he wanted and others followed suit and did it um, and he turned the company around. Um, he, he had his team of people who, with whom he liked and fostered that. But for that majority of the organization, it was very like, you do what I said, <laughs> kind of philosophy. Um, I'm going to tell you, like, my mom would be authoritative. She's not on Facebook Live, so I can say it, right? She's like, you do this how I want you to do it. And I, I would try to find creative ways to do, like, my chores. And she was like, no, you didn't do it right. I'm like, the, the dishes got washed. It doesn't matter. If I did glasses and plates and pots, I'll do whatever order I want to do it in. The dishes are clean, right? I'm not sure if you guys, you guys have dishwashers, but my mom forced me to wash them by hand. So you guys don't have dishwashers or no? I'm making an assumption. But has your mom or parent told you how to wash them and how to do them? And that's just how you do it. And if you didn't do it their way, it was wrong. Yeah, it's a standard, most efficient way to wash dishes. <laughs> if, you, if you wash the pots first, then you got to clean the water again because it's too much grease. See, Jared's being, Jared's being authoritative. <laughs> I'm just joking. I was just using an example, but yeah. Um, <laughs> as, long as, as long as I ain't, uh, yeah. what the next one was, autocratic, I good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, but it's, a, it's only one standard way to wash dishes. Anything else is, is not sustainable. So we all know Jared's leadership style, don't we guys? <laughs> there was no other way to do it besides that order. Um, any questions on authoritative? I'm trying to figure out how I get authoritative though. I mean, it's a standard way to be efficient in washing dishes. But that's your that's your thought, right? So someone could have a different way of doing it, right? As efficient as as the as the way to do it. Like you oh. go from less greasy to more greasy at the end. Mm -hmm. But so yeah. much shorter, so do glasses, silverware, plates, then pots. Well, or say glasses, plates, silverware, then pot. So is there, where do you put silverware in? Does that- I put pots, I put pots as definitely last. Exactly. So, so, so where, wherever else comes inside, yeah, I give you your leeway to make a decision. So can I move me? Can I be moved a little bit from authoritative? So you do have some flexibility. But if you said, yeah. but you guys, you guys see where I'm going, don't you? If someone said it yeah. has glasses, silverware, plates, and pots, and it cannot be any other order, that's the only efficient way to get this done. That will be authoritative. All right. All right, because I go forks, then glasses, then plates, then pots. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, I do glasses first. I do glasses first because I don't want it slippery in there too long. So I, I, I just get them out the first. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it makes more sense you do the glasses first because you're always drinking over them and it's less grease. 
Exactly. Thank you, Trey. Thank you. So there we go. <laughs> that looks sound good. As long as it's clean. Yes, as long as it's clean. Yeah. All right, the next one is pace setting. Um, leader leads from the front, constantly set high standards for their teams and expects them to exceed with minimal management. They set the cadence for the team and, uh, and um, expects others to follow suit. So the biggest thing is, you know, goals are achieved quickly because if you want to, if you want to be in it, you got to be in it. Because if you can't keep up, you're gonna you're gonna fall out of, out of the group. Um, it highlights competencies of highly skilled and experienced teams. And so that's one thing too that these leadership styles, a lot of times, dependent upon the group that you're managing, right? So if this is someone's first job, you may need to be authoritative, right? They don't know better, right? They, they, have, no, they have no input, they have, they have no other experience. So you may need to be authoritative, but once they develop some experience, you can move to pace setting, okay? It, it is helpful in times of crisis because again, they're following your lead, they're following your suit. A con is that because if you as a leader are high performing and high achieving, and they're not as high achieving and high, you know, performing as you are, they can get stressed and overwhelmed really quickly, right? They, 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 they can't keep up emotionally or physically um, to your lead. The work can be repetitive and they can get little or no feedback. It's like you keep up or you're, or you're out. Now, I'm not sure if you guys watch 30 for 30, right? Michael Jordan, The Last Dance. Michael Jordan is a pace setter. That is him. Right? You think about how hard he was on his team. His leadership style was pace setter. You keep up. And if you couldn't keep up, what did he do? Made you regret not keeping up. <laughs> Made your life a living hell. Exactly. There was no coaching. Oh my God, let me help you in the gym. I'm going to come on Saturday for five hours. No, no, no. He was like, if you're on the Bulls and you want to do this three peat again with me, you got to keep up. I forget who's the one player that he embarrassed. Um, it wasn't a Steve Kerr, I think it was. No, no. It wasn't Steve Kerr. No, it was a black guy. I think he was like a um. I think. Oh, the center. He was a power forward. Hmm? Yeah, the center, the power forward, the big guy. Yeah, yeah the big guy. I forget his name. Yeah. Um, you know what I'm talking about, right? Remember? How yeah. He and he embarrassed him. There was no coaching. It was like if you can't keep up, I'm going to embarrass you. Yeah. So Michael Jordan would be a good example of a pay. I think he's a leader, right? I mean, you cannot deny he's a leader. He led his team to six championships, right? So you can't say he's not a leader, right? Best player of all time. Scottie Pippen don't like him, I just found out. But they may not like him, going to Jafar's point, right? They didn't like him, but they respected him. And I think who else asked? Jabez, right? They didn't like him, but they respected him. Right? So you may not like Michael Jordan, but you have to respect his results. And he was authentic. He was who he was. And he and I think he'll go down as the best player of all time. I'm not going to debate with y'all. That's my generation. Well, not, he's older than me, but I grew up watching Jordan, right? But that's a pace setter. And that's one thing to think about when you're a leader. That's a leadership style that worked for him and it created results. And I think any other leadership style may not have generated the results that the Bulls were able to achieve. Any other leaders that you can think of that would be a pace setter? I think to keep it on basketball, um, Chris, Kobe. Chris Paul is definitely, yeah, Chris Paul, well, I'd say Chris Paul. I like Chris Paul. I'm so happy for him. He's making it to his first NBA fight. Oh, finally, finally. I so, agree, so <laughs> Thank excited. you very much. Like, I completely <laughs> agree. Yeah. So I, I overdue, have let it. Yeah, but he I, is a great he is a great leader. Um, I like to call him the equalizer because mm -hmm. he gets um when he gets on the court, his team it's almost as if he comes the team yeah. down. He paces everything, and out mm -hmm. of his presence, just he he's he's able to get his team creating and making the shots that they need to make. And we 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 have obviously seen it throughout the whole yes. um playoffs i mean my sense, he wasn't there but you could see mm -hmm. that there's a calm that he brings to the court when he's on mm -hmm. it it's a quiet totally calm, agreed. collected um presence that he has 
but it's so undeniable. And I respect that type of leadership style. And then so Jafar, oh, you saw what happened last night. Everybody don't right. like you. They right, push- everybody right. don't like you. <laughs> right. And, and so, they also said that too, a, a lot of people actually dislike him. They say he flops a lot and he does all these other stuff, but everybody has to respect him whether they, li- whether they yeah. like him or not. Yes, mm-hmm. you have to respect him. And one of the things that's amazing to me is that all of the players that he plays with, they're, they're not no big name players. No one really knows mm-hmm. them, but he created or helped to create um, a championship ball club with his, with his leadership and his presence and his ability to make the people around him much better. You don't like him, but you have to respect him. 16 mm-hmm. years in the game, and you know what I mean? Like, that Crazy. is big. Mm-hmm. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. So I, I think you guys can see that contrast is great for the team but other people won't like him right other other people he has a very clean cut image right him and his state farm i'm not sure if you guys get we have state farm commercials here so it's like family centric wholesome commercials he's always in people hate him for that right right so think about that right so you have someone that's taken his team to the nba finals Right, Jafar, perfection from the outside, no cheating scandals, married with two kids, and people still find a way to hate him, right? So sometimes, no matter what you do as a leader, there's always going to be individuals that are going to question your judgment, question your skill, um, and that's just what happens to leaders. Plus, that I think is true. That is true. So, so I don't mind watching him, Sarjo. I don't mind watching him in the NBA Finals. Like, go Chris Paul. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, my to be honest, I really wanted to see Brooklyn and Phoenix plays off, but hey, you know, <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see what happens. It will be interesting. Well, you know, I live in Atlanta, so th- this is going to be interesting because, you know, Atlanta. Oh. Yeah, it will be. Uh, is Trey coming oh, back? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> nah, he's out. He's out. Oh, okay, nah, he's, he's out. out. He, he's out there. He's out there. <laughs> All right, okay. And Giannis is in Bahi, well. Giannis is out, right? Yeah, Giannis is out with the torn ACL. So, yeah. Okay, so that's basically the series there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they're up now. So, I think, I think, Tra- I think Trail will be back, but we'll see. Okay. Right, let's, keep let's keep going. So, the next one is Democratic. This one's pretty, you know, intuitive. You, you probably heard this word a lot. It is a participative shared leadership. Uh, members of the group take a participating role in the decision making process. And it's equal participation of everyone. So as you would imagine, if everyone feels their thoughts and values are being incorporated, it increases your engagement, right? If someone asks you your opinion on something, you naturally will get more engaged. When you feel more engaged, you become more creative. So it better fosters innovation and allows the team to take on larger responsibilities and grow professionally, right? So the more responsibility you give someone, it helps them just grow and make better and better decisions, right? As long as they're giving coaching and, and that, that feedback. The cons is, right? You ever ask five people, where do you want to go to dinner? <laughs> Instead of one person saying, we're going to get Chinese. When you ask five, well, I want Mexican. I want this. I want some, you know, I want some snapper. It takes forever to make a decision, right? So. The previous styles, which were autocratic, authoritative, even pace setting, there's one individual driving and leading the group. They have an idea and people follow. Now we're transitioning to, we're getting consensus building and more engagement. So you see the pros is that people are happy and excited, but this, the con is that when you make a decision, it takes forever because you, now you're getting a lot of input. Um, not good in times of crisis, right? If you need to make a really quick decision, you, democratic is not the best way. And also it requires a skilled and experienced team. Remember as I mentioned that experienced people, this can work, but if you have a bunch of 17 year olds, I hate to say this, this is like cause for disaster if you're doing this in a democratic fashion because they don't have enough experience to really make the right decision and, and kind of create consensus. Anyone that you can think of that's democratic.
Donald Trump. Mm, mm, mm. I wouldn't say, sorry, did I say that loud? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say Donald Trump would be. I would say Barack Obama would be this way. Barack Obama was very much a democratic leader. Um, he gave his cabinet a lot of authority. Um, and then they came back to him. I would say, so go at that, but I'm happy you brought up Donald Trump looking back because he is going back guys. What style do you think Donald Trump would be? Autocratic, authoritative, or pace setting? He would probably be Democratic. Yeah, Autocratic. authoritative. Um, I don't take him much as an autocratic, so it will be probably authoritative. That that would probably I think would be most fitting for him because I don't think it doesn't seem like uh because based on how U.S. politics work, he really can't be like that. Mm-hmm. So I authoritative agree. probably is the best. I, I think he's authoritative because you, you saw that he did give his people levels of responsibility in his cabinet based upon how he wanted things done. But then once they didn't do something the way he wanted to have done, what happened to them? Go on. Out of there. Out of there. Right. Um, so I'm going to end it there because we're on, we're on Facebook Live. But that's a good thing. You know, it's a good way to see is that he he let people lead as long as they did something the way he wanted them to wash the dishes, right? As long as they did plates, forks, pl um, plates, knives, oh, I'm sorry, glasses, knives, plates, and pots, you were good. But Jared, if he tried to do the pots first, you were out of there. Like that's how Donald Trump thought. There's no other way for you to do something um, as an effective leader. So I definitely think authoritative would be his leadership style. Okay. Um, the next one is coaching. And this is a relatively new style. So these things iterate through time. Um, and this is leadership is characterized by collaboration, support and guidance. Um, coaching leaders focus on breaking out the best in their teams by guiding them through um, any obstacles. And so coaching, it fosters innovation. It facilitates personal and professional development, encourages collaboration. Um, it requires a lot of time and energy as a con, does not lead to the fastest or most efficient results at times, and not best for a results-driven organization. Does this make sense to you guys why coaching how what the coaching style is yes it does okay. yeah yes yes you, you know you normally yes. see this probably when it comes to um martial art fighters if that make any sense for an example a person who's probably one of a very great coach would probably be um daniel Comey. i don't know if you watch the mms or anything like that but this is exactly how how he works and if you hear him speak he speaks ex ex almost um very very great to this from telling the person and then the mat to go from half guard to side control to full mount, all that, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Definitely. This is like a mentorship role. Mm -hmm. right? Since mentoring instead of really like supervising. Mm -hmm. So like sports teams, this is really what a head coach does, right? Um, in terms of leader, to be a really good leader, that's why I call it coach, right? Um, it's support, it's guidance. The goal is you already should have a high performing team already, right? So when you move into coaching, it cannot be someone junior or new. This is already a high performing team and now you're just bringing out the best or you're creating a team that complements their styles to bring out the best in them as a team. Right, as my Brian mentioned, so this is more of an experienced team that will be best for coaching, not a newer team. Um, so like Phil, Phil Jackson would be who I would say here, right? Collaboration, support, and guidance, right? You know, when he didn't kick off Dennis Rodman and he, you know, which I'm sure he wanted to do, but he realized it was best for the team for Dennis Rodman to stay on the team, right? And that's... Even though he's, you know, he's special in his own way, but he was, <laughs> um, that's, he has a coaching style 
a lot of guidance, bringing out the best, and he challenged them even through obstacles, right? Which would be player interactions and things like that. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And I, I, well, go ahead. I, I actually always admired Phil Jackson's way of um, coaching. Like he would just sit on the bench and, and really just watch. Mm -hmm. And during the timeouts is when he would say what he had to say, but you, you would rarely see him get up or start shouting. I mean, for the most part, from what I, from, from my, from watching him, I always admired his way of coaching because you're allowing your players to be players and to do what they know to do. And I guess point out errors along the way. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And any other leaders that you can think of that are that would be coaching? Bill Belichick. <laughs> yeah, Bill Belichick. And he's good at putting teams together, isn't he? He's really good at putting teams together. Um, yeah, he's very good at like how you saying like getting the pieces to match. Because uh -huh. I I because I, I feel inside that too. Because most times when you're picking teams. Like you lean towards more people who you who you like, and then then you would have more like like spirits and instead of developing a team that is diverse. Definitely, and um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, so he he was able because everyone doesn't have the ability to bring all stars to a team and, and achieve great results, right? To Jafar's point, we the Brooklyn Nets is a good example, right? That should have been an all star team. They could make it. So it's different. It's not just about bringing in all stars, it's bringing out individuals that complement each other to achieve those results. Well, the main person to look up for that as well as Greg Popovich. Very, very mm -hmm. good at that development players. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Any questions on the coaching leadership style? Okay. This next one, I'm going to tell you this is my leadership style. If you were to ask any of my former team members who I am. So this is a filitative. Um, they're called a visionary leadership. It focuses on positivity, a harmonious workplace and team building. It promotes conflict resolution, creates personal connections between employees and their managers to build a sense of community and trust. So the pro is that it creates effective teams. It increases employee morale provides guidance in times of crisis. The cons is if you are really creating a connection with your direct reports, it's hard to get the negative feedback, right? If someone's your friend, no one feels good telling their friend they're not doing something right. It makes it a much difficult message versus if someone's just, oh, they're a team member and I don't really have a, a connection with them, it's easier to do it. So that's a barrier to it. And because they are your friends or you, or you have a relationship with them, you could avoid constructive feedback and or you could focus on harmony versus business results, right? So there's something that if you have, like I have this leadership style um, and I'll share with you because I really liked my team and actually even now I've left that role years ago, I'm still friends with my team members. Like whenever I go to Philly, that's where I, I led them. I have lunch with them. I know their families. I went to their weddings. Like one of them, you know, they're mostly Caucasian. I was the only black person at her wedding. Like everyone knows who Camila is, right? Like she used to be her boss and now they're friends, right? So it's good from a harmless relationship. But if you know it's a barrier, you have to really, really work hard to make sure I didn't, I didn't hit those cons, okay? I had to make sure that I didn't let my enjoyment or liking that person limit my ability to give them constructive feedback and it didn't limit my business results. I was always a believer though, that I'll be quite candid. And my, my boss said this too, is that, because it was a sales team. So you see this bottom part right here. If you work really hard to, if your team likes you, they wanna do the right thing for you, right? So my belief is my team, to your point earlier, if my team likes me, they trust me, they believe that I'm authentic, right? They believe that when I give them feedback, I'm giving them feedback from a good place they're gonna work harder for me. Then someone, then a boss they feel that, or a manager they feel doesn't really care about them, is only there to hit a result and could care less about them and their families. Does that make sense? 
And I would do very unusual things. I'm not sure if Aj knows this, but like my team, we were fairly young. Like my first team I had, I was like, I was 25 years old (laughs) and my team, they were all like 23. And as a prize for winning a sales contest, I took them to the Sean Paul concert in Atlantic City. Not really routine, but they were like, you know what? Other teams did not go to see Sean Paul concerts and have the company pay for it, right? And like the whole night. But it was me saying, I know what you like. I'm not gonna give you a pizza, a pizza lunch, because you were like, what the heck is that? All right, let's put some, let's let let's really up the ante, let's create a really aggressive sales goal. And if you hit it, this is what we'll do. So for me, it was knowing my team, knowing what they like. They like Sean Paul. I like Sean Paul. We did that. And they're like, oh, this is someone who values what I value, spending the time with me, right? After work, they're invested in, in me and who I am. And they were able to drive business results that way. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. Yes, I agree as well. I'm sorry, what was that? It makes sense. I just said I agree as well. Yeah, so this is my leadership style, I'll admit. Um, anyone that you know that you think has, or you know of, I should say. Anna, can I ask, are we going to a Sean Paul concert soon? Well, Sean Paul's not flying. And I, I saw him in the Breakfast Club. He will not leave Jamaica. He is like, every, every, because he had um, Shaggy and Spice have been doing like press tours. And Sean Paul's like, I'm not traveling under COVID-19. I'm keeping my butt right in Jamaica. So I guess when COVID-19 is over, maybe I'll go, I'll go see Sean Paul, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure if I told you I was in the Bahamas actually last month. Yeah. No, I didn't share anything. I wanted uh-huh. to, I wanted to experience you fresh with no, no no information. Yeah, yeah, I was there last month. I was there for a week last month. I was there over Memorial Day weekend. Mm-hmm. Well, our Memorial Day weekend, end of May, early June. I was there. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep, I I thought cool. myself. All right. Any questions? Anyone that you <laughs> know that? Too? that has this leadership style? Um, I think I, I mean, I don't think I lead anybody per se yet, but I know in the way um, that I communicate with what I do do um, with my family business and those stuff is very much um, affiliative. Um, I personally don't like conflict and whenever I'm geared and I have to work with other um, members to achieve a goal, it is very much in the same vein. Um, and I speak very empathetically as well. So I relate to you relating to other people. So, yeah. Exactly. Any other examples of affiliate, affiliative leadership styles? Okay. So we're going to go to the other end of the spectrum. And this is laissez faire, right? This is French for leave it alone, let it be, do what you want. Um, it, it is. Uh, they assess the individual talents of each team member. Um, they, it's a workplace suitable for forward thinking employees who are intelligent and are resourceful. The pros is that if your boss is leaving you alone, you gotta come up with your own ideas because <laughs> they're not giving you any input at all. So you got, it creates innovation. You're highly motivated because if you have a boss that does not care, you yourself have to be a highly motivated person. Does that make sense? For you to thrive in an environment where your manager is distant, it fosters or the the people who are highly motivated are the ones that rise to the top, right? There's some that will just like sit and do nothing, but there will be a few that will rise to the top and and will be really, really good employees. Um, Faster decision-making because basically you got to figure out yourself and you guys just learn to make quick decisions because there's no manager intervening in your decision making. Um, cons is that you have really no guidance, um, too much isolation. So you're, he, he or she is not engaging with you. So there's no team building. And it can be seen as avoidance of leadership, right? If you're not doing anything, you don't want to do anything. So I'll share with you guys my second manager I ever had was just like this. He only met with me for our one-on-ones once a month. And that was it. He didn't talk to us. He would leave early every day to go golf. He would take long lunches. Maybe it was, he did get fired though. So I I think it was more the avoidance of leadership was where he fell into. 
<laughs> but uh, he, you know, he just let us do our own thing. And because the team was rolling and we all knew what we were doing, he just took his foot off the gas and let, it just, let us just, you know, keep going. Um, so it can work in certain environments, but I think towards the end, I was, it was more avoidance of leadership is what he was doing. He was enjoying golfing more than helping our team. But I think he started off with good intention and just kind of fell back a little bit too much. Um, does anyone know any leaders that are more laissez-faire? I do. <laughs> My current uh, boss is this way, which is a great thing, actually. Um, she's a very great leader. Um, she has a hands-off approach, though, because she respects the talent and skill that um, our team has. She lets us do whatever, mm -hmm. and we don't disappoint. And for me, that works well because it gives me a chance to I mean, for lack of a better word, do me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's my current situation. Okay. So it can work well, right? It does because um, we don't have to deal with the micromanaging, which isn't fun when you're being micromanaged, when you're being watched, when you know that you're a professional person, you know that you know what you're doing but you have someone who is consistently breathing down your neck. It doesn't, it doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. So her hands-off approach has helped me to grow as a journalist. So, cause that's my day, day, day to day job. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. okay. So I have to, I have to. It works well though, because you need to be creative to be a journalist. Yes, right. right. And we have to come up with our own ideas, our own content. Um, and, and basically she leaves, she leaves. if she does have an idea for us, which is very once in a blue moon, um, she would pitch at us or because we've been working from home as well. And we haven't re really been seeing much of one another. So if she has an idea, she's going to pitch it and say, hey, um, follow up on this, maybe check this out. And even then she leaves it to us because she knows that we're going to do what she asked us to do when she when she asked us to do it and she knows that okay when it's time for deadline I don't even have to ask them I know that they're going to bring me quality work and work that can be published for the following day mm -hmm. so she has that much confidence in us and I I I, I could take that style of leadership mm -hmm. Any other laissez-faire leadership styles that you, you, any of you are familiar with or have a manager or a friend or someone that has this leadership style? Okay. All right, so now we're wrapping up on time. It's almost 8.30. So I'm gonna end with some resources for all of you. And these are the books I've all read them myself. Like, you know, so I'm not just like, oh, let's Google some names. I read all these books. This is these podcasts. I'm going to share some with you. So one of my favorite books is called True North by Bill George. Um, it's like he's like he's a professor at Harvard, I believe. And what he does is he interviews real leaders and what influenced their style, right? So one of the things that like really compelled me was um, Howard Schultz. You guys know who Howard Schultz is. You have him all around Bahamas. I saw him. So I know you got him there. He's a CEO of Starbucks and he talks about how he developed his leadership style working at Starbucks. So I'm not sure if you guys know, he did not come from wealth. He came from a single parent household and he talks about how his upbringing, and his other leaders too, it's like the CEO of Pepsi, like other leaders are, you know, in the book, but they talk about how their upbringing created their leadership style. Remember I said it has to be authentic. Right, so like with how I'll give you an example for Howard Schultz, it's with Starbucks employees, he's one of the first companies that gave access to um, health benefits and a retirement plan to part-time employees because his mom was part-time and when he was growing up, she didn't have access to benefits. So he always remembered that. And when he had his own company, that's something he had prioritized in building as a leader. So I think it's just really important. So you find out that the term true north, right? When you're on a ship and directionally, you go north, it's your true north, it's your compass, remember? So 
when I mentioned when you make decisions and you do things with good intentions, true north is your compass, right? It's doing something that feel good that feels good to you. So these leaders are talking about their compass, what their true north is, and how their background and how their experience led to their leadership style. So it's one of my um, good books for leadership. The other one is the confidence code. Um, and it really goes, and I'm gonna pick on you know, Jafar. So for women particularly, it's written by Caddy Kay and Claire Shipman. Um, I like it because women at times, we, we have kind of, we're not as confident as we should be and we should be overcoming at times, but we let fear hold us back. And so it's a lot about women and confidence and building confidence. Guys, share with your significant others, your sisters, others. Um, I think it's a really good book because even for me, you know, my biggest regrets in my professional career is when I lacked the confidence that I, that I should have had. And it's a good book about how to build that. Another one is Good to Great by James Collins. Um, this is like a huge leadership book, but how do good companies become great companies, right? Um, how do they structure? How do they move? What decisions do they make? Um, so for those that are looking to lead strong organizations, it's a great book. Um, the last one, I think this is gonna talk through um, Jared and Jafar's questions, Leaders Eat Last by Simon Sinek, right? And it talks a lot about how being a leader can be a thankless job. And you do, to be a successful leader, you have to put other people ahead of you, right? You have to put other people's interests, right? Because if you're a leader that is thought about as self-serving and thinking about your own interests, people won't follow you. Leaders need followers. <laughs> and so this book talks about how you have to take ego you have to take all those things out of it to be a really successful leader. And the last book is just a regular book. It's for leadership, but it's for anyone. Um, but it's, you probably have heard The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Um, that's also a really good book um, to read. And the reason why I say that is to be a leader, you must be effective and you also must be, must be self-aware just as a professional. So this is a really good foundational book for all of you. Like, if I were to say any order, I would say Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I would say True North by Bill George. Um, Leaders Eat Last and Good to Great. That would be the order I would read those books if you haven't read any of them because that's how they build upon each other. And then if you're a podcast person, um, I'm getting there. Um, but Coaching for Leaders by David Stashewick. Stashewick, Stashewick, um, Leadership Biz Cafe is my favorite, more, this one better by um, Tanvir Nasir. Um, HBR, um, um, Harvard Business Review, Idea Cast is good. And then particularly for African-Americans, I really like Secure the Seat by Mindy Hartz. Um, she talks about being black in corporate America, the challenges of facing um, you know, diversity issues and things like that or being the only one. Um, and leadership. So I like Mindy Hearts a lot. And then here's my info if you guys want to follow me on Twitter, Instagram, all that fun stuff. So any questions? Yes, I do. I do have a question. Uh, first of all, thank you for the great presentation. It was very informative. Uh, I would like to know, is there any uh, shortcut, is there any app, any program that you use when building a team um, to make sure that you surround yourself with the adequate personality types. Because I know it, that would be a bit difficult for a human resource, or for, for us who, do, who don't have a human resource department, to go through tons of resumes, persons looking to work with you. Do you is there any shortcut to that process to find out which personality types work with you, work against you, and which personality type do you have? in front of you with the resume. Yeah, so there's a couple. So one of them is whenever you hire, you wanna assess your current team first. Um, and there's one called DISC Leadership. Hold on, I'm gonna, I can't remember the acronym. I know the acronym, but I can't remember the, let me see, give me one second. It's DISC. And DISC Leadership, it kind of, it, it builds upon what we talked about today. Yeah, it's a DISC assessment. And a DISC assessment, it tells you 
how your team is structured now. Let me give you the acronym, hold on. Can you spell it please for the yeah, listening so, audience? So it's DISC, it's D as in dog, I as in individual, S as in Sam and C as in Charles. And what it means is DISC, what they stand for is dominant, inspiring, supportive and cautious, right? And you need all four in an effective leadership team. You don't want one. So the dominant one is like the dictator we just talked about. So the dominant person would be your authoritative, um, it would be your, let me go back. It would be your, oh goodness gracious, Camille. So I'm just gonna map them out. So your autocratic and authoritative will be your dominant personality. And it's good to have them on your team because these are the people that you know can make or think and make quick decisions. Right. So when things are really going rough, these are the ones to like say, all right, let's, they're the ones that like step up and make decisions quickly. Thank you, Ash. Inspiring. This is the one, this is the group that's, that's going to be visionary. Oh, what am I doing here? There we go. Okay. These are the ones that are going to be more visionary in their approach. Supportive. Now, supportive, there used to be this HBR article called B players, A players, and B players. You guys heard that before? So A players are your overachievers, like rock stars. But you can't have a team of rock stars. Why? They could be like the Brooklyn Nets. <laughs> they can, right? They're going to be fighting for top position, and they're always at some point wanting to leave and do their own thing, right? They always want to be the number one. You can't have a, you can have them for a little bit, but you can't sustain them, right? Now, supportive, these are your B players. These are the people, like, you know, I've been in the same job for 15 years. No more, no additional responsibility. They like to come in, leave, done for the day. I don't want to take work home. I don't want to be the manager. I just want to do this and go home, right? Do we know those people? But there is a benefit to those people, because why? They get things done. They get things they done. Get things in, and they are not going to try and cut other people to mm -hmm. achieve something that's, that may not be there. So they're mm -hmm. not killing, they're not killing world morale. Exactly. What are other benefits of these supportive pe people or B, or B players, we call them? Most of the times, they're the most predictable people. So you know exactly what you're getting from them. Mm -hmm. yeah. No more, no less. Mm -hmm. What are some other benefits? Thank you. These are all perfect. So when you're in a company, don't things change all, all the time? Don't you try something new? Like, oh, you're the new manager. Let's try this. It didn't work. Let's try this. It didn't work. Let's try this. It didn't work. What happens if you've been there 15 years? You have what? You you've seen it all. Them. Yeah, you've seen everything. You have context, right? Mm -hmm. So when a new manager comes rolling through, you can be like, all right, Jabez, I know you are excited about this job, but that idea, we did that three years ago. And let me tell you what happened. Yeah, that's true. Right? That's very so, true. So you want to be player because they're the ones that are writing it out. They've seen it all. Not saying, Jabez, that you can't do what you want to do, but they can tell you, here's what here's what we did here's why we didn't why it didn't work and maybe you can figure out how to make it work this time so it's good for you as a leader to have a b player because they're the ones giving you insight to say if you want to do this don't do it this way do it this way because i've seen it the other way okay and the last one is the person that people are going to hate and that's the cautious one and what would you call the cautious one? Who, who do we often call these people in, in corporate America or just in, in overall? Devil's advocate. They're the naysayer. I don't know about that. I don't know if we're going to, I don't know if it's going to work. I don't like, I don't know. I don't know. Like sometimes you do need someone to poke holes in your ideas, right? Everyone can't be as gung-ho as excited about these things as you. So you do need someone that's gonna say no and you have to convince them why.
because the art of convincing someone why solidifies your conviction in the idea and you find poke, you find and you poke holes in it, right? So to your question, that's a really good, and that's what leadership teams do is before you hire and go out, you wanna assess your current team. So you know if you have two dominants, one inspiring and um, one, cautious, one supportive person, but there's no cautious people, you should look for a cautious person. You should look for someone that is very detail oriented, devil's advocate, naysayer type of personality. You may not like them, but they'll be good for your business in the long run and your team. Does that make sense? Yes, it does make sense. Perfect. Uh, it leads me to my uh, second question. Um, in doing business, right? It's a kind of difficult question, but I'm going through this uh, phase in my life as well. So I'd like for you, when, all right, if you make a commitment, all right, um, is it ever okay to break a commitment because your heart isn't there anymore? Like, like your gut is telling you not to go with the commitment, but you already made a commitment. And so in order to go through with your commitment, you kind of like have to go against your gut. I think it depends on how serious this commitment is and how serious your gut and intuition is steering you away from it. I'm a firm believer we all have intuition for a reason. We all have that gut feeling for a reason. I tell you all the time, like I'm the kind of person, if something in my spirit does not like someone and I can't figure it out, I'm gonna watch that person before I'm, I'm really watching you. I'm not engaging anything with you, I'm watching you. Because if my spirit for some reason does not feel good about you or an idea, that spirit or that intuition is there for a reason, right? I'm, I'm gonna joke, I'm a big, I used to grow up watching Oprah. And I remember the woman, you know, Oprah, I used to all, I'm, you're probably too young, but Oprah used to have people who are victims of crime and like, oh, my gut told me not to go in that room, but I went in that room anyway and I got shot. Like, you know, I'm like, you know what? This is why you listen to your intuition. Um, so listen to your intuition, right? It's there for a reason. Second, what is, what's the level of commitment and what is the harm to the other person is what I would assess, right? So, and, and, and where are you in that commitment stage? So did you just tell this person I was gonna do it last week and you haven't really begun and things really are in its infancy in motion? I think it's okay to go back and say, you know what? I don't really feel good about this. You know, I think it's better you partner with someone who really has conviction and is really supporting your idea. I'm not there yet. If it's early, I think it's okay to, to do it, right? And you have to express why, right? You have to, you can't say, you know what? I'm not feeling no more. Like you can't say that, right? You have to just say like, this personal conflict. I don't have the time. Um, I have other priorities for myself, for my family. Like you really have to communicate with people when you do, I'm gonna use the word renege on a commitment, right? Now, if it's further along, that person has made an investment, whether, what, you know, some type of it, it, it's things are going in, that person can be adversely affected. Then it's about, well, how can we compromise? How can I give you something to not leave you hanging? Or can I find someone who can fill my steed? right? Because you don't want to leave people hanging. Like if, if, if this is like the bottom of the ninth, I'm using the baseball, right? You're going to be like, you know what? I'm done. Like, okay, you can't do that. Like, because at that point, it's your reputation and it's your brand. And if you're known as someone who walks away at the end, it's not good for you professionally. So if it's later on, see what you can do to compromise. Or if you can't do it, find someone that can take your place and say, well, who can help you where you are right now? Let me help you, let me help find someone to finish this out for you and make a really, really good interest in, in wrapping it up. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did, you did completely. Thank you very much. Well, Camilla, thank you very much. Guys, ladies, let's give Camilla a round of applause for her work today. I, I thank you, uh, excuse me, Camila. Yes. <laughs> I have to get it right. 
Sorry about that. You can get Camila right. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, once again, ladies and gentlemen, this was a great session. Camila, thank you very much. I, I just to let you know, guys, I put the presentation in the WhatsApp group. So you have it there. You can refer, refer back to it. I think it's also a good exercise if you kind of look at not what understand what your leadership styles are, because she said something that's very important. Depending on the circumstance and the group which you're working, you may have different leadership styles that you may invoke. And I'm quite sure innately we have a particular style, but if you're if you're coaching young kids, then you you, you have to take on a coaching leadership style. But also when you work with your leaders, how does your personality, when we look at the when we're looking at the EQ, how does your personality interact with your upline or your leader style? Because sometimes your, your styles conflict, but you need to maintain that environment. But the more that you know about yourself, and then also the more you know about the other person's style, then you can see where it's in their nature and it's in your nature, and you find where you have that empathy and you try to compromise. If you remember from the EQ exercises, you kind of follow through some of those divides. So once again, Camila, I want to thank you. And to our face group, Facebook audience. I thank you for watching. We will have a couple more things to move along with our program and we will see you next week. And, and next week's session will be on communication styles and presentation, st presentation styles. So when you're an effective leader, how do you communicate? How do you present? Those are important factors that will have to develop your leadership, your leadership acumen. And next week will be Nahaja Black who are from the hit back with Nahaja Black, she will have present that piece for you. In the meantime, Facebook audience, thank you. And we'll see you next week, Thursday. Cheers. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Camila. So the Facebook audience is off. Again, okay. I wanna thank you. Any of last questions before Camila leaves for this evening? And please, as she said, and I told you guys before she arrived, reach out to her. She's very supportive. You know, she'll, she'll be back in the Bahamas, who knows how soon. And then and you can, you can kind of reach out to her in the interim and kind of go from there and just reach out for questions and services. And um, one of these, like I said, one of these days, she'll be, she'll be our, uh, one of our clients, our foundation. We'll see where we get there. An the ultra high net worth person. <laughs> Could you uh, drop your, uh, your Social media tags again, please. Yeah, yeah, it's I mean, the, yeah you, well, you can do it, Camila, but it's also in the, in the presentation I put in the WhatsApp, the last page. All right. All right. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Okay, thank you, Camila. All right. Yeah, guys, don't leave. It's not time for you to leave. I, Mario has some things to present to you. Okay, thank you. Mario's all yours. Can't hear you, Mario. All right. Okay, now we can. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, I, I didn't really have um, much to um, present other than, um, you know, obviously I really liked what we, what I saw um, this evening. Very interactive. Uh, this is what we really need to show, um, you know, the viewers on Facebook. You know, obviously with this being recorded, it's also going to be posted on the Facebook Facebook website and a lot of people, you know, do watch it. So this is the type of show that we want to present to the to the public in order to, um, you know, draw in more interest into, into the um, into the foundation and uh, whatnot. But I, I really I, I enjoyed it. I, I hope you guys have enjoyed it as well. Um, but otherwise, um, I don't have anything. Yeah, I, I didn't have anything planned to, to present. Okay. But, you know, we'll just um, obviously we'll keep you posted um, leading up to the next week, and you know we'll be interacting with uh, the, the the various groups on an individual basis just to check up on them and make sure that um, you know things are uh, are progressing well. Okay. That's, that's it. okay. Thank you, Mario. Let me ask Trey. Trey, do you want to talk about what you work what you're working on for business development? Let everyone know.
I guess he can hear me. Trey, did you hear me? He can't hear me, so we'll move along. Well, guys, well, thank you very much. Uh, so the quick question, were you able to look, get, are you able to go back and look at the recordings or no? Oh, no one has really tried us yet. Uh, what about the OneDrive? Are you having technical problems accessing the OneDrive? I'm not sure if those if persons are having difficulty or not. I know one of those, it was only the audio. One of those when I went back, it was only the audio. It wasn't the video. I couldn't get the video. You couldn't get the, you couldn't get the audio. You got a video, but no audio? I got the audio, but no video. You got the audio, but no video. Okay. Okay, because we have this And worse. There's three links. There's an audio only link, and then there's a video and audio link. It's two separate links. I've but been I'll, able to view it on Facebook. And I think that's simpler. That's been simpler for me. Okay, just to view it on Facebook. Okay, so I yeah. will make sure we post. Well, this one was went live on Facebook, but I, again, yeah, I, I had some technical problems. We'll, we'll, I think we'll, we'll get to that pretty soon. So anyway. I, I think I should. I, I think... Um, the, there's a little mix up because there's two Facebook pages, the main one, and then there's one that begins with you on U N D U T U. Yes. Yeah. So uh, what I did was I just, I just took the link and I shared it onto the main page. So, okay. but, but next week we'll be, we'll, we'll be, we'll be prepared. Yes. Yes. Hopefully I pray for that. That we will be. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I look forward to your continued work. And we'll see you next week and, and continue with your group work and we'll kind of go from there. Sounds good? Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, good night. Good evening.